everybody for coming on Saturday because tomorrow is a busy day for most people. Yes. So if you're making it, it means that you had some sacrifices to make, some choices. And the subject of leadership is very difficult for me to talk about. Everybody understands Moses. He didn't want to be a leader. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what religion you're in. Islam, you understand who Musa is. He really didn't want to. And most of us have been thrust into positions of leadership, not because we desire it, mm -hmm. but because there's been a gap. Because he saw two people being ill-treated by the Egyptians, and he intervened. Remember? And then he had to carry a whole bunch of people that didn't want to go to where he wanted them to go. But we're not happy with where, where they are. Who understands what I'm talking about? <laughs> you, you have many people like that. Yes. I don't care whether in your, in your group, people you speak to, they are not happy with what they're doing right now. And you're trying to get them, let's go to the other side. And they'll give you 52 reasons why they will get up from where they are now and don't want to take the next step and next step and in the meantime you are losing time mm -hmm. because you want to go somewhere <laughs> you're, 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 too, you're too tired of being held in bondage by ignorance because there isn't any difference between all the people I know that are multi-millionaires and billionaires and people that are begging and living hand to mouth there's no difference Except this, one wants to go through the wilderness at a time of unpopularity, lack, and want, with the hope and knowing that there is somewhere better than the where they are. So they got, get up and start going. I've seen real, real young men that have thrived. It's not because they have better ability than the people that are not thriving. It's because of this thing, leadership, trying to persuade them to get up and go. And so I will encourage you, because I've had two remarks today that are extremely useful, and I hope everyone here takes that on board. In whatever you do next week, next month, next year. Has anybody ever spoken here to a group of people and somebody came and wanted to see you and thank you for what you said? Who, who's ever had that? Yeah. Have you? Yeah. Great, okay, keep your hands up. If you've written a book, <laughs> Okay. Keep your hands off if you have a video of you of that message on YouTube. If you have a video of it as a podcast, if you have a podcast of it. Okay. See, all of us that put our thank you very much. Let's put our hands together for you. All of us that put our hands the first time, we will have problems with leadership. Because when you spoke, there were 20 in the room or 30 in the room. One person knew you had something for them. One person wanted to be led by you ideologically. That one person came to meet you and thank you for it. Now, what you must do is that there are 5,000 other people in that same position now, not tomorrow, now. And if those people can hear you, they will also thank you. Wow. So the cheapest thing for you to do is get your seven-year-old. Can you see that young man? I've just seen him for the first time in my life today. And he is my best technician. <laughs> I just spoke with him in five minutes. I've never met him before. In five minutes, we're able to pull some things from YouTube, pull some things from my Facebook account, pull something, and put together a presentation that is incredible. So, can you so you might find out that your six-year-old, your seven-year-old, and your eight-year-old are better technical leaders because they are afraid to make mistakes. But when we buy phones, we say, don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. When really, we've reached an agreement in my house that when I buy a new phone, I give it to my son and take the old phone. If anything is, if I have a problem with the old phone, I ask him because he's my technical director. <laughs> you, you understand what I'm trying to say? Because if I don't give it to him, he will take it anyway. <laughs> and he will still use it. So if I need an app in the new version, he helps me to use it. And now I found that in school, those skills has distinguished him in school. Oh. 
and exposed him and had made him a leader mm. in the school. But I, when I bought the phone, I, didn't, I was not thinking of making him a leader. He had natural propensity. You know that. They are digital natives. They explore and explore and explore and until you get very irritated and want to take it from them. So I bought it. There's my receipt. It belongs to me. But he knows it more than you. So conferring that leadership opportunity to him makes him far more useful than you might think. And that's leadership training. Without calling it that. In five minutes. Yes. So what I want you to do today is be able to walk out of this room doing something radically different from what you did before. Yes, because each time you have spoken and your speech is recorded, you can dump it on Facebook. You can dump it on any of the platforms. Like, like my, my the second to the last speaker was saying that we now have a global audience. It doesn't matter. As I'm talking now, someone is on Facebook Live, another person is on Periscope. So whatever I'm telling you no longer stays within the confines of this room. It's going further and further and further. And you are impacting people. And that's what leadership is, essentially. You're changing people's direction from going towards destruction to going towards their destiny or going towards their goals. And ignoring the hierarchy above you. Because if you look at the hierarchy above you and the politics around you, you will fail as a leader. Yes, sir. Ah. Yes, sir. So Pharaoh will come and get you. That's what, yes. what happened to Moses. <laughs> so Pharaoh was ready to get Moses anytime. Yes. And when he changed his mind, he pursued him again, I pursued him again, I pursued him again. The painful part is, I don't want to miss the promised land. I don't want to see it that far out just because of the complaints of the people I'm trying to lead. Because they are the ones that are going to distract you. If you don't believe it, you think it's Moses? No. Ask a gentleman called David Cameron. Ask him about the referendum and the pressure put on him to make the people vote on what is now called Brexit. He will still be prime minister today. Yeah. But the people complained. And then he listened. And then he changed his mind. And he never got to the promised land of the second election that he was going to come. So it's not a biblical principle for us to just live. It's a daily reality. Yes. It happens in your place of work. It happens in economics. It happens in your employment. It happens in your education. So is that strength for you to go on when you have such a barrage of criticism sometimes that makes me wonder, is it really worth it? Then you know that your relationship with the system you're working for is incidental. You have a bigger relationship, you have a bigger calling. So if you ignore the relationship you have now with the people that you see, your people that you don't see will strengthen your conviction and that will produce results. I'm gonna, uh, yeah, if you can advance one minute. Or if you can back up, back up, just back up one minute. If you go on Amazon, you get this book. It's on Smart CEO Leadership Execution. I'm not trying to promote the book. You don't need to buy the book. You not know people buying the book. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's on Amazon. You not know people buying the book. And each time, like my friend introduced, each time I come up and comment on CBC, CNN, or RT, somebody goes to buy the book. I don't know why. Until I wanted to find out the people that have read the book, what their comments were, and they did a free workshop to go on it. That's why I then found out, really, People are not interested in how much you know. Do you know that? People don't really care whether you have a PhD or double PhD or you've been a professor or you, you know. People are more interested in how what you know has solved their problem, their immediate problem. Mm -hmm. What you know has shifted them from where they are now to where they were dreaming to be. Therefore, I'm not interested in what your colleagues want you to talk about. Uh, do you understand that? Yes. Yeah. You, you're not interested in what your colleague wants you to talk about. Your, your colleague wants to show off their knowledge. You want to show someone the path to greatness. Mm. Because you are only a leader as long as you produce more leaders. Oh, yes. mm. If you produce followers, you're a failure. Mm. Because you've just assumed office. And then you just walked in the office. 
So Godwin put together some scripts when I, after I, I finished speaking and then begged me to write a chapter in the book. I wrote a chapter and then we compressed it and we played around, we used it in the forward on it. Until people said, no, I read that and I didn't know this was the truth. I just found out this was a part of the truth that I was looking for. And that solved my problem. And therefore, thank you. Can you come down to my company to speak? I said, but I didn't write that book because I wanted to speak in your company. I said, yes, I know. I said, yes, yes, of course we know. So said, okay, now that you've spoken, do you mind being on the board? I said, board? I said, no. He said, because what you said about what was likely going to happen in the, in the future, about our sector, is very valuable to us. So that's exactly what Joseph did. He just confirmed, well, these are 10, and these are seven fat cars, and these are seven things. And these ones are going to eat this, and, and, and that's the beginning of the whole world of economics. Oh. Mm. And he said, as Pharaoh said, okay, if you found that, then you better come and implement it. I made him prime minister from prison to proper leadership. Mm. Do, 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 do we understand that? Yes. Do we understand that story? Yes. He became not just the economic advisor to the king, he led, he had to implement his economic policies. So when they talk about boom and bust, and it, they're talking about that in Wall Street. I tell them it's not new. <laughs> it's not new. Somebody said, say you're going to have a cycle of real, real depression, and then you're going to have a cycle of prosperity. But prosperity is going to come before depression. Do you mind saving up when the time of depression? Do, do, do you don't understand what we're trying to say? So there are, there are fine principles that are applicable when it comes to politics that we gloss over because we didn't see it in a book called Political Science. Mm. And there are fine principles we apply to economics that we do because it's not called an economic book, we think those principles are invalid mm. and therefore we run around and, and drive around. So let, let us file. Um, I've never ever ever participated in any dramatic production, not film production. Now this is why I still enjoy leadership. Somebody was my student and the person came to meet me and spoke I spoke with him and his friends and I told them look do you know the level you're operating now you can operate ten times more so why that would I try and explain to them you see Shakespeare says some men are born great others become mechanized mechanized greatness you know what I mean by mechanized greatness you become a mega and then you become great <laughs> You marry into, into greatness. All that have greatness crossed upon them. And so we think that there are three levels of achievement when you talk to people. But no, that's not what is true. Every single human being that you're talking to today has greatness in them. It's for us to be able to express that greatness. And I told him, you are as great as me, if not greater. So no, you just flash me. I said, no, you are great. You are probably greater than me because you have better tools. I didn't have the tools you now have. And he... he and I, I forgot about it. And about 17 years later, he tapped me on, on my shoulder and said, do you know something? I said, yes. So who are you? So you don't remember me? I said, yes. I can't remember. He said, yeah. I was a student, and you said this, and you said this, and you said this, and you said this. And my other friends, one of them is in jail. Mm -hmm. The other one is dead. Mm -hmm. I won an Oscar. Mm -hmm. The only reason why I won an Oscar is because of you. Jeez. And then he gave me the statuette. So do you understand why I'm saying you cannot do anything because of your colleagues? Because they are there to distract you. They see you as a competitor. You're doing it because of the people that are listening to you and people that are impacting. You're not doing it because of your employee. Ah. If anybody employs you, you that's not the reason why you are in the leadership position. No one can employ you to be a leader. If you think anybody can employ me to be a leader, I'll resign now, be a backbencher, mm. and throw stones from there. You know, you're free, you don't have any responsibility. You, mm. Nobody tells you why is the pound falling. Mm. Nobody will tell you why is it that the congregation is falling. Because someone will always ask you why is something falling. Nobody will ask you why are the marks falling. Because you have a great conviction that is radically different from what your system will want you to mm. produce or provide. So, Thank you. If you can move over, and just please fill up. So when I had one black girl, I'm saying that because I, I want to be very provocative. 
from Hackney. Those of you that are in London and uh, familiar with the East End of London, <coughs> you know what Hackney is known for. It's not a place where leadership is made. If anything, it's a place where slave ship and servanthood is conferred. Because the education you're given by the state, we all know that it's of no. The government knows that it's of no. And they give us the impression that when the Almighty came down, he was giving out IQs. He gave her IQs out in Westminster, he gave it out in Kensington, and they went to Chelsea. By the time he got to Hackney, he ran out. <laughs> and some of the, the people that you speak to would defend this. And the government used our money, taxpayers' money, to conduct research, to validate this. That your postcode is equal to your brain code. And say, we don't expect people from Hackney to go to top leadership training places like Oxford or Cambridge. And so when she applied, or when she was thinking of applying to Oxford, the, t the her teacher looked at her and said, um, you? <laughs> this, is Hackney. this school has been here for almost 100 years. Not one single student has been admitted. Last year, Tony Blair, Prime Minister, his son was even rejected. So you must be on something very strong. <laughs> to start with this, that somehow a black girl from Hackney can go anywhere near Oxford. And she told me, I said, ah. I said exactly what I told the other gentleman, that look, there's greatness in you. There's greatness resident in you. If you know how much greatness is in you, you won't take my words seriously. You will exceed whatever I tell you. Because one cell from your brain, just one cell, not every time you have a baby, you have the baby is born with one million million brain cells. Every time. It's been scientifically proven. I'm not asking your opinion. They've done MRI. They've studied the neurology of, of uh, the, the, the neurology of the newborn baby. And one cell of the one million million cells has capacity to add, to subtract, to multiply, and to divide faster than any known calculator. Texas instrument that makes it wanted to va validate when, when you say you were fearfully and wonderfully made. And you just say that as a sentence. I no longer believe that. I don't believe that. Why should I memorize it? They took one cell. These are scientists. Texas instrument makes is the largest chip making facility on the planet. They took one human cell and lined up 10 calculators against one cell. Guess who won? One cell. They now took a network of network against one cell. Get who won? One cell. They now got a network of computers the size of NASA's computer against one human cell. One human cell won. Why do you think I will accommodate or entertain the fact that you said you are bad at mass when you have one million million cells? Why are you trying to persuade me? Say it to somebody else that doesn't have this understanding. And I didn't read it in a theological book. I read it in a scientific written experiment to say you were fearfully and wonderfully made. 